Model kits can be frustrating for the model railroad beginner. I know they were for me. You see the picture on the box and you think, yeah, I'm gonna build exactly that. And then days or weeks later, you're sitting there with dried glue all over your fingers and paint in all the wrong places and the frustration that sets in. Today, I want to help you avoid that. This video is brought to you with support from my patrons on Patreon. These videos would not be possible without them, and if you'd like to join the Patreon community, you can follow the link in the description below and join for as little as $1 a month. Quick preface, I would not consider myself a master model builder, but I have learned a bunch of things that have gotten me to a point where I'm confident in buying a kit and building it. Now this took me years, so I'm going to take those years of painful and expensive learning and give you some tips for building model kits that you will be happy with. Let's get started. Today we're going to be building the Wathers Cornerstone InScale Medusa Cement Company kit. This is one of their more popular kits. It is one of the classic injection molded kits where it has the little grids from where the plastic ran through it to the individual parts and the parts come in two main colors. And the first thing I like to do is check out the instructions and then I will separate out all of the parts into their two main sections, which in this case is the towers and everything that goes on and around the towers. Now the first tip I'm gonna give you is actually for removing the parts from all of these grids. And that is, when I first started, I would literally just twist them and try to remove them, and that would leave some ugly burrs. So the first thing that I do when I'm removing these is I grab a set of nippers and I cut them out, and the nippers have a flat side to them. You want that flat side to be the side that is closest to the actual part. Also, you might have some flashing on there, and you'll wanna cut the flashing off in the same way with that flat side closest to the part. This is going to make the burrs that you have on the edges a lot smaller. Now, it's not gonna get rid of the burrs completely, so you'll need to do something else. And that's where our next tip comes in, which is using a little sanding file right here and just sanding those burrs smooth. It really doesn't take that much sanding to do, but you'll end up with some nice smooth parts right here. Now, the next tip is to, before you get into building, you wanna make sure that the parts are all good, do some inspecting, wipe any of that excess dust off of it and you also want to check and make sure your parts fit that you have done some work on and then you can finally start gluing. Now Starbond is an amazing glue. I love it. It is a cyanoacrylate, a cyanoacrylate, acrylate, but the chemical reaction does put off some fumes. It is CA for those of you that know what that is. Make sure when you're using this that you're in a well ventilated space and you may want to even consider wearing a mask and maybe even some eyeglasses if you're sensitive to those kind of things. Now we can start gluing things together which is when stuff gets really exciting and the next tool that I'm going to use is something that I had no idea even existed when I first started building models and that's these 321 blocks. These are extremely heavy steel blocks and they are great for holding things in place uh, when drying especially things with right angles because they're machined and they're just really precise and they can actually you can see here I'm using them like another set of hands to hold the model in place now the Starbond glue dries pretty quickly but it's nice to be able to have that extra stability as I'm gluing additional parts on and it helps just build the model so these 321 blocks are an amazing tool for model building I'll link a pair in the description below I actually own four of these and I think that's a good number to have. Now it's pretty difficult to get the 321 blocks wedged in where they are right now. So what I ended up doing to get these final pieces to dry in place is I put the 321 blocks on each side and kind of use them as like almost like a pressure cast to, to hold these in place and they hold the spots in place as they're drying. And then I'm able to put the top piece on with ease. And then I just used the bottle of super glue that I have there to hold it down while it dried and it left it to dry for a while. 
The next tip I'm going to give you comes from building the second part of the model, which is the shed where the cars come in and deliver their aggregate. I had some pretty long parts in this particular section, and they suffered from a common problem of injection molded models. They have some warping, and the way that you fix warped parts is to apply heat to them. Now, the easiest way for a beginner to get parts unwarped is to get something that can hold some hot water and put the parts in there. And for this case, you want to make sure that they can lay flat, but basically the heat's going to make them malleable. The way that I do it's probably a little bit more advanced. I do some very brief blasts from my heat gun. You can literally see the parts bend, but you do have to be very careful with this and be pretty confident and know what you're doing in this. But I use a 321 blocks to hold them down flat, and that seems to work pretty well for me. But warm water, I highly recommend. So once you get these parts flat, the 321 blocks come to the rescue again and allow you to get those nice square joints for the seams that you have to glue together. When I'm starting to glue them together, I do little dots of super glue um, across the different sections and then I will, once they are held in place by a couple of 321 blocks, I'll come in and do a nice bead of super glue and I'll hold them in place until they dry. And as I'm going, remember to keep sanding off those burrs, there are a lot of them, and then just rinse and repeat, putting on more of that glue. While those parts are drying together, I go ahead and start assembling the shed walls. And this is pretty straightforward. It just has a few different parts. And one of the weird things about this is it's only three sided because it's butting up next to the towers. This is another place where those three, two, one blocks come in handy for squaring off those corners. Now, if you squared everything off and glued everything in place properly, the roof should go on and fit like a glove. I will use a 321 block to hold it in place real quick as it dries just to make sure that that bond and that seam are nice and snug. Now it's on to the little parts, and you'll see that I'm not using the nippers for this. I am using a hobby knife, and the reason for this is that the nippers can't quite get close enough on those small parts without damaging the parts, and the hobby knife can make those cuts and just make a nice, even, clean cut, and once I pull those off, then I can bring in the nippers and trim off any overly large burrs, but then I also can sand the pieces as well, just like anything else. It really doesn't take much sanding, though, when you're doing this. And then once it's together it's pretty much the same process you just this is the most fiddly part and that's the great thing about the starbond glue is it comes with the applicator tips that make it really easy to apply but you're basically just going to be assembling this and putting it together and it's going to take some time this is really where it takes some patience and construction because you're going to have parts that maybe fall crooked and everything but you want to make sure that you get this right so just take your time and put it together according to the instructions. My next tip comes for those really small pieces. Obviously don't cut your finger with the hobby knife when you're cutting off the burrs and then sand them off, but a pair of tweezers can go a really long way for doing those really tiny pieces and they help out a ton. You can see, especially when I install the ladder next, that it just really helps so much with the precision. And then also when you're putting on the little tiny handrail. And once again though, the 321 block comes in handy here as I'm able to use it to square up the handrail. So that 321 block's pretty handy. One last thing I do before anything else is done is I do as much test fitting as possible. Now, let's get to painting. This is my next tip. Spray paint is your friend. Here you see me putting on a primer before I put on the actual coat of paint that you're going to see. And a lot of us don't have airbrushes or don't have the skills with airbrushes that we feel comfortable doing this kind of thing. So spray paint is definitely your friend in terms of getting a nice even coat. I do say always try to use a primer first. Also another great little tip, the boxes that the models come in are great little trays for spray painting and they definitely help out a ton as you can see I'm using it right here. 
Once that is dry, you can start putting on the actual colors you're going to use. And you want a good solid base color. Basically when I'm doing this kind of thing, I like to think of the base color as what the whatever I'm painting look like when it's new. So for this, I'm doing a concrete color and my go-to concrete spray paint is Rust-Oleum's Aged Gray and it just looks like a very solid concrete color. So I'm gonna do this base coat and then I'm going to let it dry. Next up, it's time to start doing a little bit of weathering. And for this, I'm gonna take a brown taupey color and I'm just going to give it some quick uh, burst with, while I'm rapidly moving my hand, give it some nice streaks. And I'm really just trying to emphasize the places on the towers that I think maybe some dirt and soot from runoff and water would hit. And I just wanna kinda hit it all over the place to give it just a hint of just looking like it's been there a while and it's older. You know from seeing these out in the real world that they never look perfectly. By the way, there's my dog. Hey, how you doing? And this is just how these things look so doing these colors is very important now the next color i'm going to bring in is black and this is just my kind of grime it up color now the first thing you're going to see me do with the black spray paint is i'm going to really aim for the cracks and crevices just kind of give some emphasis on those and also just use it very sparingly to add a little bit more of that grit and grime and that is the first thing you're gonna see me do. Now, the second thing is actually a little bit of a technique that I've developed for weathering, and you're gonna see me spray the cardboard. Now, what I'm doing here is you'll see me get close, and I'm actually hoping for the spray up from hitting the cardboard to hit the bottom so that the bottom parts are dirty where there's been runoff and all sorts of things like that. And this is actually a really good way to get just a light amount of paint in there versus actually having to hit it and it works really, really well. Now, the rest of the pieces are all metal and I'm gonna have to weather them differently, but what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna give them a nice silver base coat. And what you want when you're doing this is a smooth silver metallic finish. There are some different types of metallic finishes in spray paint. There's one that kind of has like the silver glittery flakes and you don't want that. This is Krylon's Shortcuts and I will link it in the description below. And it gets a really good solid coating for a silvery metallic color. <laughs> Um, for different things. So this is a really great thing for uh, coating the base coats for metals and just make sure you get a nice even coat. Again, we're going to weather these separately, um, but this will give me the good coat to work with. All right, now we can begin assembling all the pieces that we just painted. And the key thing I want you to take away from this, no matter what model kit you're building, if you pre-paint as many pieces as you can before assembly, it's going to make your model look a lot better. And this is simply because you're going to keep reducing the risk of paint spillover, and that paint spillover will ruin the illusion that you are creating on your model. So I assembled all the pieces that could be painted the same color, I painted them, and then I came back and glued them, and it just, it makes it look a lot more realistic. Yes, you may have to do some painting after it's assembled, you're gonna see me do that, but if nothing else, you can take a few colors and make something look really, really good. A lot of times things in the real world aren't made of a ton of different colors. They're made of two or three colors. So definitely pre-paint as many things as you can before assembly. It's going to help with the illusion you are trying to create with your model. Now I did have uh, some issues with the silver spray paint, nothing that's wrong with the spray paint, it just, just some ways that I painted it and some things that I had. So I came back with some acrylic metallic silver paint and just did some basic touch up so that I could do some weathering. So I'm gonna have to do this touch up and then let it dry and then get back into doing a little bit more of the detail painting. Now, what we're doing here is a technique called dry brushing. Now we have some corrugated metal uh, panels right here, or at least that's what it's supposed to appear like. And these things can rust sometimes. So I have a few different colors I can use. Now you may think immediately rust, you wanna use a dark red. Well, actually what I'm going to use here is a brown because a lot of times when you have rust, it's not just rust, it's a, it's a brown look. So the way that you do dry brushing is you dab a little bit of paint on a brush. You typically wanna use a, a flat bristle brush 
and then you're gonna wipe it to where you get like maybe 80 or 90 percent of the paint off so where it's very little paint getting on here and then in the case of this with the corrugated metal look I'm going to be going with the corrugation so that it looks like some rust and some dirt has run through those so and this is just something where if it looks uneven this is really where your eyeball comes in so you're gonna go until you like it now when we get to the roof though I am gonna show you something that is just a much better technique for roof so roof you tend to have some runoff directions and it'll happen in specific areas so what I decided on my model I didn't really look at anything but basically the areas where the the tanks and the towers bulge out the most I thought there might be a lot of runoff coming out from those spaces so I made the rust and dirt and sediment trails coming from where the the towers bulge out the most so I don't have just an even dirt across it it looks like there's been some runoff there and then I also put some uh, runoff look at this little at the little silver tower where the aggregate goes up into it so these are just some of the things you want to think about when you are doing this if you're looking to get something aged think about where water runs because a lot of aging and weathering is done with water so Take your eye, figure out where you want to see water running and things like that, and that is what's most likely going to make your weathering look realistic. Make it look like water's run through it. The last little thing I did for weathering, I didn't really do too much on this model, was I just wanted to dull some of the silver. So what I did was I took some heather gray and I mixed it in with some of that uh, acrylic um, metallic silver paint. And I just mixed it in and I did some light coating, not quite dry brushing, but not quite regular painting, and just did a little bit of coating and a little bit of dulling of the of the silver paint. Now obviously you can do dull coat, but I also wanted to make it look like really the shine was coming off of it. So I just did a little bit of this, not too much, I wasn't too specific, but it ended up turning out okay. The last thing that I need to do to this model is put the company nameplate on it. And Walther's included several different names, and this is a good thing because I didn't actually didn't want it to be Medusa Cement. So I went ahead and glued the nameplate on it and used a 321 block to dry it in place. Once that was done, I could attach the decal, which is a water decal. So I dropped it in some water and soaked it. And then you'll notice that I'm using tweezers to pick it up. Tweezers are great for water decals. You just have to be very careful not to poke holes holes in it so um, just be very gentle and then another thing you'll notice is that I pull the decal across from the side this is just a simple technique that I have learned that just makes it a lot easier to get that decal exactly in place versus trying to have and just drop it in place pulling it in from the side works a lot better and you're gonna get a lot better result And now I can place the model. I'm personally pretty happy with the way that this model turned out. Now I haven't blended it in with the scenery because I'm waiting for some gravel to come in so that I can blend it in, but it looks great. I'm really happy with it. It blends right in with everything else. There are many of you out there who have built dozens if not hundreds of model kits over your entire hobby career and you have no problem building them. But the bottom line is that model kits can be intimidating, especially to beginners and especially with how much some of them cost. My hope is that with these tips, you can feel confident in building your own model kits that you really love and enjoy the way that they turned out and look on your model railroad. Thank you all so much for watching. Until next time, I'm Jimmy from the DIY and Digital. Stay safe, be kind, and happy railroading.